Planet Fitness is the most convenient place to get that big fitness energy. Equipment for every workout means you can get in, get energized, and get going. Join the judgment-free zone today. For $1 down, $10 a month, no commitment, cancel any time. Deal ends Wednesday, July 19th. See Home Club for details. This episode is brought to you by Choiceology, an original podcast from Charles Schwab. Hey there, how-to listeners. Before we start the show, I want to let you know about a fascinating podcast from our partners at Charles Schwab. It's called Choiceology, and it's hosted by one of my favorite scientists, not to mention good friend, Katie Milkman. Katie speaks with Nobel laureates and authors and athletes and kind of everyone to understand the psychology and economics behind the decisions that we make. So stick around to hear more about it later in the episode. Listen to Choiceology at schwab.com slash podcast or wherever you listen. It's an immense amount of pressure to be living your own life and living other people's lives in, in a sense, you know, Yeah. Mm. Um, and trying to navigate the systems during all of that. Welcome to How To. I'm Carvel Wallace. You know, one morning back in fall of 2007, when I was in my mid thirties, a stay at home parent with two little kids, I got a phone call. It was a physician telling me that my mother had fallen ill with lung cancer and the prognosis was not good. She was already at stage four. She lived across the country from me then, 3,000 miles away, and instead of telling me how long she had left, the doctor simply said, if I were you, I would make arrangements to get here as soon as possible. So I did. I left my wife and my children and I found myself lost in a maze of appointments and cleanups, insurance and long-winded medical terms. Eventually I brought her back to Los Angeles to live and ultimately die with us. My mother was a single mom. She had me when she was really young. She was only 55 when she died and I was her only child. No one I knew had gone through this yet and I didn't have anyone to help me. I just fumbled through it as best I could. Now, I'm at a point where so many of my peers are catching up, entering into this caregiving phase with their parents, their in-laws' parents, and even people they may have really complicated relationships with. Like, I haven't been close to this guy for years, and now I'm in charge of finding him dementia care? Even if you do have a close, loving relationship with an aging person, This transition can be really fraught, interpersonally, financially, medically, and on top of everything else, it can feel really isolating, like there's no support for you. Sometimes it feels like you have to learn everything on your own. And that's the situation for this week's listener, Danny. My partner and I have been caregiving first his father. We're both only children. My brother passed away, so it's just me and him, and he's an only child. Their caregiving journey started unexpectedly. One day, her partner's father wasn't feeling well, so he went to the ER. This led to five years of hospital visits and transitioning in and out of assisted living before eventually landing in a nursing home. We sort of learned by trial and error. We lived in a one-bedroom apartment in Los Angeles that had only stairs and no parking. So it was impossible for us to bring him home as well as just financially. We are not in an income bracket to have in-home health care. As they were caring for Danny's father-in-law, they also started to care for Danny's mom. She had a pretty serious fall and has never fully recovered. She has short-term memory issues and dementia. And we were connected to an advocate, and it was so vastly different, the experience, if you know how to navigate the system versus trying to learn it on your own. And then knowing that my partner and I don't have children, there's no one who will care for us, um, just being realistic, you know, and if there is a future in which we foster or adopt, would never want to put our children in the situation that we are in now. It's too much to do on your own. So to guide Danny and all of us through this, we're joined by someone who has helped countless families face the same tough questions. My name is Amy Goyer. I serve as AARP's family and caregiving expert. 
this focus on family, I think for me, is the perfect fusion of my personal experience and my professional experience. I've worked in the field of aging for, okay, almost 40 years now. And, um, <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and I also have been a family caregiver for my grandparents, my parents, and my sister, um, my parents for about a dozen years, uh, very intensive caregiving. My dad had Alzheimer's, my mom had had a stroke. So I have lived this and this is a mission for me. So today on the show, we're gonna find out how to care for others and how to prepare to be cared for ourselves because it's not a matter of if we're gonna need it, it's a matter of when. Stay with us. Get a new Apple Card account by July 25th and get 10% back on App Store purchases for your first six months, up to $100 daily cash. Terms apply. You can earn on games like Candy Crush Saga and Roblox, subscriptions like Apple TV+, Plus, in-app purchases, and all the good stuff. Apply now in the Wallet app on iPhone. Subject to credit approval, 10% daily cash earned on up to a maximum of $1,000 in qualifying purchases is valid only for the first 180 days for new Apple Card accounts open between July 11th and July 25th. To make a qualifying purchase, your new Apple Card must be set as the default payment method for the Apple ID associated with your Apple account in the App Store. You must have a zero balance on all digital Apple accounts associated with your Apple ID. Visit apple.co slash app store for more important offer details. Hey everybody, it's Tim Heidecker. You know me, Tim and Eric, Bridesmaids and uh, Fantastic Four. I'd like to personally invite you to listen to Office Hours Live with me and my co-hosts, DJ Doug Pound. Hello. And Vic Berger. Howdy. Every week we bring you laughs, fun, games, and lots of other surprises. It's live. We take your Zoom calls. Music. We love having fun. Excuse me? Songs. Vic said something. Music. Songs. Music. I like having fun. I like to laugh. I like to meet people who can make me laugh. Please subscribe now. We're back. You know, there is so much that is difficult about caring for a family member. There's the emotional toll. There's the grief of seeing someone you love in decline. There's the fatigue of managing a complete life on top of the one or ones you're already responsible for. There may even be feelings of guilt. Are you doing this well enough? How can you do this on top of everything else? You can't. Balls get dropped, appointments get missed, and there's also the simple naked logistics of navigating our expensive maze of a healthcare system, insurance companies and deductibles and referrals and exceptions. Danny was facing all of this, and it was a lot. There is absolutely guilt that we didn't know when he first went into a nursing home that we could have gotten some financial aid to get him into a better living situation. And even with my mom trial and error of you think one thing is the focus and then you learn halfway through that that's no longer relevant or that's what you, the kind of rabbit hole that you were going down is a dead end and then you have to regroup and you're stressed, you're grieving. All the complicated trauma or relationships comes up when people are depending on you we don't have a good relationship with death in this country. Yes. So when you say, no, I don't want to put in place all life-saving measures, she wanted, when she could advocate for herself, comfort measures only, you do get a lot of judgment from other people in the system where they're like, you don't want to do A, B, C, D. Mm -hmm. And to A, have to say, no, and then they there it feels as if they're right. There's this sort of like, all right, well, if you want to kill your mom, um, yeah, you right. know, and right. in addition to, you know, then having to go back to work after saying, well, I guess let's do this level of care versus this level of pain management. And not yeah. everybody chooses to do it, you know, but if you do choose to engage at what price? Right. Because yeah. all of these things take a toll, whether people show up or don't, whether you say today I can't follow up with this office, I have to do this other thing. Yeah. So, yeah, absolutely. And those things take their toll. I guess I'm wondering, how do you or did you keep your shit together? 
you know, it w- it's a process. Um, <laughs> You're like, I didn't. <laughs> yes, exactly. Who said yeah. that? That's a bold yeah, exactly. assumption. Yeah. That's, <laughs> you know, mindfulness meditation has been really mm-hmm. helpful. Mm-hmm. And trying to, I guess, accept things as they are has been the gift and the challenge. You, you know, when you said <laughs> about letting things be as they are, it reminded me that, you know, there is this serenity prayer and it's like, help me f- let things be or help me fight things when I need to fight them and yeah. help me figure out the difference. It's yes. like, you yes. need all three. Um, all right. So I want to bring in Amy. What are your thoughts hearing this? You know, we have so much in common when we're caregiving and yeah. everybody's mm. situation is so unique. You're like nobody has exactly the same set of circumstances because everybody's health conditions unfold differently. And their wishes may be different and the relationships are different, but yet we have certain things that are similar and in common. And I think that, you know, that struggling to take care of yourself while you're caring for others, uh, the the experience of trying to make the best decisions and constantly making decisions and choices yeah. for someone else, you know, yeah. you don't walk into the situation knowing exactly how, uh, you know, Medicare works or Medicaid or your various advanced directives and death with dignity. It varies across states. And so it, it's complicated and people's health insurance is complicated. And yeah. and even if you, you know, feel like I have a solid understanding of this, you encounter someone in the healthcare system who just isn't cooperating and who isn't communicating, right. who isn't following the rules. Well, even that's exactly it. Like in California, at least, you can choose your own hospice and you can choose your own home health. But because all of these facilities have relationships, they just say no. But I don't have any of the mechanisms to enforce that, you know, and then all of this is a reminder that who's going to do this for us? Well, this is so I want to we have two really big questions here. And one is like this one about navigating the system and what it means to to do that as a child of someone who is entering into end of life care. And the other one is this perpetual question of like our mortality, the one that like sort of lying in wait for us. And and that comes through the lens of how we're going to be cared for. So, Amy, I want to start backwards with you. Your career, as you said, almost 40 years is in understanding and talking about and teaching about and advocating about elder care. But I want to ask you, what do you have in place for your aging and end of life care? How have you thought about that or prepared for that? Yeah, it's a very good question. And I'm kind of in the same boat as Danny in that I don't have children. Um, I have some nieces and nephews. My uh, boyfriend of 16 years, my life partner has many nieces and nephews, but neither one of us have kids. And so there is that feeling of, oh God, who's going to do this for us? Yeah. Mm. I think too many people think of, you know, the legal things and that sort of thing, but they don't think about how they want to live. So that could be location, climate, transportation, how close you are to family, how close you are to a grocery store. It can even mean how well your house is prepared for aging in place. One of the key things that comes up over and over is socialization. We're talking a lot about end of life kind of care with Danny's experience today, but we need to think about for our lives a much longer span. We live longer with chronic illnesses and, and, you know, arthritis or various things that may limit us. Most people need gradually increasing support of some type. And living in isolation is one of the worst things for your health. So Mm. that is a factor when you're planning for your own you know, older years, think about how am I not going to be isolated? This includes expanding your social circles, tending to your long-term friends, making it a point to hang out with your neighbors, even dealing with resentments you might be harboring that are keeping you emotionally distant from the people you really love. Some people say, okay, I'm going to do kind of a a golden girls kind of thing and have Mm -hmm. roommates and have, and we kind of look out for each other or an an intergenerational house sharing kind of situation where I have someone who moves in, they do things for me around the house, take me to appointments and that type of thing. And they have a lower rent. So knowing what the options are in, in your community or where you think you're going to age. And you can do that homework by like uh, Danny was talking about assisted living and finding out, oh, there were some subsidies that might have helped. Find out what those programs are in your in your state. 
um, what the income level aspects are, what are the housing options, are there senior communities where you age in place across the different levels of care, what do they cost, you know, get some realistic information, contact your local area agency on aging and ask about what are the home and community based services in my area, so that you are familiar with the options. So that's your first piece of homework. Your next piece of homework isn't as fun, but is just as important. You need to get your paperwork in order. Advanced directives, your estate planning, and who's going to manage it, which I think is kind of what Danny's saying is, is like a, one of the biggest challenges. And you know, your, your estate planning, I would I would try to talk with um, an attorney who's part of the um, National Academy of uh, Elder Law Attorneys or um, estate planning attorneys. Um, there's a document called the Five Wishes, which is a really great thing you can download from their website. And it gets a lot more nuanced about the specifics of how you want the end of your life to be. And, um, you know, get all that paperwork in place. But then figure out who's going to make sure that my wishes are adhered to. Who's going to be that person who's going to advocate for me if I go in the hospital? Or who's going to water my plants if I suddenly go in the hospital or take care of my dog? And that's, you know, goes back to your social network. But there are also people you can hire to do that. They're often called now aging life care experts. And then they step in and they are your advocates. I guess my question, and this is I not to be difficult, is a lot of these resources are expensive. How do I even find what that organization is that may be able to connect me to financial aid or advocates that are not $500 an hour? Right. So first Thank of all, you, by the way, oh, I appreciate absolutely. it. No, I know this is, it's overwhelming. And I've been working in this field my whole career, and it was really hard for me still. Now, yeah. caregiving for my parents. So keep that in mind. Like this is, it's not unusual that this is overwhelming. The first thing I, there are several resources I would point people to. First of all, AARP has great state caregiver resource guides that mm. list a lot of these organizations, these agencies, the state agencies, um, and it's, it's aarp.org slash caregiver resource guides. And they're online guides and they um, include things like this state has a special respite care program. Mm. Um, and I'll give you an example. I have a, a dear friend who's an attorney. She um, was serving on the uh, Alexandria, Virginia Commission on Aging, caregiving for her mother who was living with her. And right after her mother passed away, we came out with these guides and I sent it to her and she said, I did not know that that Virginia had this respite program. And here she was like on the board for the area of yes. aging group. So <laughs> yeah. this getting things communicated is so key. The other absolute go-to place that I always send people is the Area Agency on Aging. There is a service of the Administration on Aging, the U.S. Government Administration on Aging called the Elder Care Locator. It is a search tool and to help you connect with the aging services in your state or your local area. Um, you can search by zip code and it will give you the results for your area, including your state division on aging or office on aging and your area agency on aging. They know the lay of the land best of anyone and they can do their best to hook you up with someone who can help you. I fully admit that they're not enough, you know, it's still really hard sometimes you know, because you, you, they're, they're long waiting lists for people who need those legal services who can't afford to pay, you know, the $500 an hour. Well, that's why I'm thinking about what I, exactly that of what I can do now, right? While I can be more persistent and have more mental and physical agency and acuity to put some of these support systems in right. place. Right. You absolutely are, are so wise to be doing this. So here's our next insight. Putting your documents together and working with attorneys and financial advisors can seem expensive, but not doing it can be even more expensive. That's why it pays to do this stuff in advance before it's too late. When we come back, we'll hear precisely why you need to do your homework and plan wisely. Don't go anywhere. Hi. 
Hi, I'm Willa Paskin, the host of Decoder Ring, Slate's podcast about cracking cultural mysteries. And we're back with a new set of episodes. We're looking at kissing, the romantic, sexy kind that's so ingrained it seems like something people everywhere have always done. But what if they haven't? Wait, what? What do they do? Do they hug? We're also going to dive into the mosh pit to find out if alongside the aggressive swirl of flying elbows, there might be some order. Well, the first rule is, if you don't want to be in the goddamn mosh pit, get the hell out of the way. And then we're going to sniff around one of Italy's best-known cheeses to ask a real doozy, where is the most authentic Parmesan in the world being made? If you want to eat the original Parmigiano like our great-great-parents used to eat it, you have to go to Wisconsin. You can hear these episodes and more in the new season of Decoder Ring, wherever you listen to podcasts. We're back with Danny and Amy Goyer, family and caregiving expert for AARP. Before the break, we were talking about the cost of preparation. But it turns out that cost might just be worth it in the end. I will tell you that um, in caregiving for multiple family members, you know, over more than a dozen years, I even though I, I maximized everything for my parents, my dad, I got him veterans benefits, everything. It was not enough because my dad had Alzheimer's and 24 seven care. Even with me providing, you know, 60 to 80 hours of care a week myself, I had to pay people while I was working, et cetera. I ended up going bankrupt. Oh, wow. It is a cautionary tale because I did everything right and it was still not enough. What I did not do right was I took on too much of the financial burden myself. And Mm. I, I had a financial advisor for my parents, but I did not have a financial advisor for myself. And I feel pretty sure that had I had one, they would have directed me to do some things differently. Yeah. And, you know, you never know. But I, I had decided to be open about this because I am not the only one who's experienced financial yeah. devastation because of caregiving. Mm-hmm. So when you're when you are thinking about even if you have children who might be caring for you in the future, you know, think about protecting them in that way. And, my, you know, it, it wasn't my parents fault. They planned. Um, my dad got Alzheimer's. He made some poor financial decisions towards the end, you know, before I stepped in and started helping. And um, so they had depleted all their savings and investments. And all they had was long term care insurance and veterans benefits. And my dad had pension and Social Security. But it still, you know, didn't didn't get us through, you know, that a decade spending that five hundred or a thousand dollars to have a financial planner. Yeah a financial plan for you and address some of these issues is going to be well worth it. I think the big question that I I keep sitting with is like, uh, our system is so, so fucked. Like, I'm just going to name that. I think we all know that. (laughs) Yes. And, uh, (laughs) and so Uh even though it's often, I don't know, like useless to ask this question, I still like to ask this of people who are experts at dealing with systems, what should this be like ideally? Like if you could be given Amy a magic wand mm. and someone's like, Amy, I would like you, you've spent all these years thinking about elder care. Mm-hmm. I would like you to remake the system. Go. What would you do? Well, one of the things I would do is just have a lot more support for uh, family caregiving and older adults aging in place in their own homes. Much more uh, more resources going to home and community-based services so that to make them affordable somebody to come in and clean up the house, meal Mm -hmm. delivery, um, you know, chore services, transportation, those things can often be the pieces that make it so somebody is okay, safe to be in their own home. But Mm -hmm. you, you know, they're limited. There's often long waiting lists. They do the best they can with the money that they have. But we're aging. We baby boomers are aging. We're just going to need more and more of it. So I would have a lot more resources going to support that and to support family caregivers like Danny and her partner who have, you know, kind of gone through hell and back to do this. And, uh, you know, it shouldn't have been so hard for them to navigate the system, right? So let's mm-hmm. have a little bit more in place to support them, help them find, you know, the resources that are available. I do want to pause here because so many of us take on caregiving responsibilities and don't really talk about it. So it's hard to know just how reliant we are as a society on caregivers like Danny, Amy, even myself. 
Caregivers provide an estimated $600 billion in free labor each year, according to the AARP. These hours can be the equivalent of a full-time job, and 75% of caregivers are women. It's a huge service that goes unnoticed, unpaid, and largely unsupported. And I would also have more a uh, volunteer core kind of thing going on where yeah. there are many people in this world who want to help others, but they yeah. don't know to hook up with there. You have a neighbor who's aging in place alone and needs a ride to the grocery store once a week or something like that, who would be perfectly willing to do that, but they're not connected. Well, it's like you yeah, don't and, know what you don't know, right? So yeah, if you don't, right. you don't and, know what questions to ask, ask it, yeah. or that these are available. And you know, and just to chime in for two seconds, I think we also in this country have to value caregivers and value old people. Yeah, in some ways, I mean, I'm really curious about this the psychology that uh, of of what happens to us when we become caregivers, especially for parents. And there's obviously an entire number of episodes we could do about that but this feeling of i i really related to when you said i the, some version of um feeling like i can do this i've yeah. got this yeah i and yeah. and not only that you can but also this feeling that you have to yeah. that there's like no you just have to chin up and just muscle right, through and right. just whatever I can this out you know I it is what it is fine. yeah I can do this and yeah. then and then you don't. And as you say, you have to understand when you're caregiving, there's an emotional drain, there's a physical drain, there's a mental drain. And you you kind of have crises coming at you every day. And, you know, it's exhausting. And so sometimes, and I'm not, please understand, I did not go into bankruptcy lately. I d tried everything I possibly could to avoid it. And I yeah. met with multiple lawyers and financial advisors after my dad died. And Every single one of them said, you do not have a choice. This is what you have to do. You're never going to get out from this. It won't work. And that was just devastating for me. And it's humiliating. Mm. Um, it, is, it, it, it is just a horrible process. And it took two and a half years to become final. It was a horrible, horrible process. However, I really, I, I came to the conclusion that, you know, they were right. I had to listen to the professionals. But I think what's hard is that people don't talk about money. Um, I have had, I've given speeches and talked about this and had people come up to me crying afterwards saying that happened to me too, but I've never told anyone. Mm. And that's why I tell my story because mm -hmm. it is a cause. so much shame. Yeah, there's so much shame and it is, it, 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 it's, it's horrible. And I did an interview for um, a major newspaper and some of the comments on it online were so hurtful and so awful yeah uh, and people made said things like oh well she just filed bankruptcy so she could get her her parents inheritance i was like if there was any inheritance yeah what inheritance had to do bankruptcy. <laughs> i mean come on <laughs> you know it, it yeah. was it's just one of those weird yeah. things yeah i'm thinking about um what is the care for the caregiver? Like you talked about financial advice, actually, and that triggered for me a feeling that that's actually a form of care. Like, yeah, it it's is. not just a consultation. It's it like exactly. it's like it's 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 kind of an admission yes. of like I don't think I can handle or correctly understand the finances of it. Can you help me? And it also makes me think about other forms of care for caregivers. I know that death doulas operate in that capacity in a lot of ways as a kind of like emotional um, family kind of handholding care for just, just to hold space for someone who's caregiving because there's a feeling of, the other thing that really struck me about your story and it made me remember this was a feeling for me is decision fatigue. It's like oh, yeah. every day some doctor's like, do you want to do this or do you want to do that? <laughs> yes. If we do this, yeah. we can do this. But if you do that, she might die. Yeah. But also it's <laughs> going to be cool. Don't, it's, it might work, but also she might die right away. But please let us know in three right minutes. Now. Yeah, right and you're now. just like, can and I so, have five uh, minutes? No. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so in addition to like death doulas and other, like what other resources are there out there to care for the people who are doing the caregiving? Well, there is thankfully more and more support for family caregivers. And this, of course, is a huge priority for AARP because we see that family caregivers are the backbone of the long-term care system in the U.S. And we, we, we want to do this. Many of us want to do this. And we either want to do it out of love or we want to do it out of a sense of duty. And, you know, we may not like the person we're caring for very much or they maybe weren't good yeah. parents, but we're doing it. And we need some support to do it. You know, we're providing $600 billion a year worth of care 
give us some support so we can keep doing this and not end up financially insecure like I have and be better prepared for our older years. There are support groups for family caregivers, and often that's where you learn about all these things that Danny's been talking about. Like, how do I find out about these things? You learn from other caregivers who's been through mm. the Facebook group that I moderate. Like, that's what it's all about. We've got 14,000 family caregivers in that group who are constantly helping each other navigate, mm. figure it out. How did you deal with this? How did I you know, deal with that? One of the hardest things as a caregiver is that you feel guilty when you're taking care of yourself. Yeah. You know, you feel like, oh, I, you know, they're more vulnerable than I am. I I should take this time to go um, do this thing that fills me up. And I one time was driving to the gas station on empty, you know, fumes, and you're praying (laughs) that your car doesn't drop, you know, break down. And I was caring for both my parents and my sister across the country. My sister had Cushing disease and um, she died the year after my mom did. And I was just in the middle of all of it and so burnt out. And I made it and I filled the car up with gas. And as I pulled out, I thought, it's so interesting. The car actually runs better on a full tank. (laughs) (laughs) Like, duh, right? But that was my aha moment. And I I tell this story all the time because it's absolutely true. And it changed my life because I thought I expect myself to be just as efficient running on fumes all the time, all the time. And I may not always be able to be on a full tank, but I can keep working on it and I have to keep filling it. And you may have heard the analogy of the oxygen mask, put your oxygen mask on yourself. But it never worked that well for me because that's like... a crisis, the plane's going down and mm. is a marathon. It goes on and on. You know, it's not even a marathon because you don't know how long it's going to be. And so you have to do something ongoing. So I started literally thinking of it that way. How am I filling my tank? Mostly you do quick things like getting a cup of coffee or tea, or I always tried to have fresh flowers in the house and, um, you know, hugging, dancing with my dad or petting the dog or Mm-hmm. you know, reaching out to a friend and um, you have to have some premium Phillips too, though. And that'd be like listening to this podcast or going to a support group meeting, or I did stuff with my parents that were premium Phillips. Like after mom got her hair done every Friday, we would go out and, you know, go out to, to eat and you have to have tune-ups and guess what? That's the hardest one. That's time away from caregiving. And we all know, you know, how do you get away from it? It follows you everywhere, right? And then you have to do your routine maintenance. Sleep. Sleep is number one priority. And you have to do a little bit of all of these. Mm -hmm. Really try to keep your engine going, you know? Danny, what are your forms of tank filling that you do in your life? You know, it's been helpful to, and, and again, there is the guilt associated with it, but making time to to actually interact with art in some way, allowing myself to read things that give me a break from thinking about it, being outside and kind of engage in something that is not um, connected to being an advocate or or caregiver. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know, music is a big part of my life too. And I couldn't sing in a choir during the caregiving years, but I could sing with my dad and music was yeah. the greatest tool with him with dementia and he loved music and and that that filled me up, you know, even just singing with him and watching musicals with him and that type of thing. So sometimes you have to adjust yeah. the things that you are that are your normal like coping mechanisms, outlets, the things that nurture your soul, but you find other ways to kind of do them. I couldn't do a big garden, but I could have fresh flowers in the house. You know, you you sometimes have to adjust those things. But I think joy is our greatest survival skill. So you have to think about what gives you joy and not only creating joy in your caregiving experience, but noticing the little Mm -hmm. things, you know, and Mm -hmm. allowing, taking the time to allow them to fill you up. Like, like when I would tuck my mom in bed at night, she was the cutest thing. She would pull her covers right up to her chin and she never moved all night and she was giving the most beautiful smile, you know, and I, 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 just taking that moment, not rushing through that, you know, and saying, I love you, mom. And thanks for, for being my mom and yeah, things fill you up. I often think of joy as not something that we create, but something we find. Um, but, uh, we're coming close to the end here and I want to return 
to the kind of the other side of the equation, which is preparing yourself to be cared for. I think we've covered a lot of that, but I also want to hear you talk about Amy, like what are the first steps? Let's say that I've listened to this podcast and I came in having really never thought about this. And now I leave the podcast going, Oh my God, everything's about to fall apart. I'm in no way prepared. What is the toolkit that I need to put together? What does that look like? Right. So um, as we talked about, think about where you want to live, think about developing a social network of people of multiple ages and, and community, your community, and then uh, deal with the paperwork, you know, the legal aspects, your advanced directives, uh, you know, uh, living will, do not resuscitate orders if you want them, things like the, the five wishes document or other anything else that's specific about how you want your care to be and who can make healthcare decisions for you. Deal with the financial aspects, your estate planning, you know, will, financial powers of attorney. And then think about, you know, what services might be available. And that's kind of part of where you want to live. Do your homework explore the area agency on aging, what what home and community-based services are available in your area, what if you want to go to a different type of living situation that maybe has a graduated care. I have a friend who's um, who doesn't have children and her husband is deceased. And she just recently moved to a like a 55 plus community that has different levels of care. And it, it for her that was what made her it makes her feel more secure that she's going to have that. She has uh, myself and other friends who are committed to, you know, ensuring that that she gets care if she needs it. And just lining up who those people are, uh, you know, try and get these things in place and, and, um, and have the conversation starting now. Um, Danny, was this, uh, was this helpful to you? And uh, also what, are you going to do next? Like, what is your first move after kind of sitting with this? Yeah. Oh, this is absolutely, absolutely helpful. Thank you so much, Amy, because it is really helpful to say, okay, what can I do now? And where do I start kind of, right, collecting the tools to inform our communities that will be there to support? And how do we take some of the, some of the weight off of those of us, you know, who are caregiving and those who will need care? And take care of the people who love us, because that really feels like, you know, this is an act of love to to to, to try and take something off the plates of people who will show up for us. Very well. As said. we need I it. I couldn't have said it better. That is you're absolutely right. It it That's doing perfect. planning is an act of love for yourself yeah. and for others that will will be there for you. We all need people to show up for us. That's the big secret. We live in a society that is compulsively, obsessively individualistic. We find ourselves trying to make enough money so that we can handle everything ourselves. And ironically, that intense labor is a large part of what keeps us separated. It's not sustainable. We need each other. Because as the saying goes, many hands make light work. Here's hoping we can all find in one another the many hands we so desperately need. Thanks to Danny for coming to us with this question. And thank you to Amy Goyer for all of her practical advice. We'll be sure to include a list of all the resources mentioned in our show notes. Do you have a problem that needs some care? Send us a note at howto at slate.com or leave us a voicemail at 646-495-4001 and we might have you on the show. And if you like what you heard today, please give us a rating and a review and tell a friend. That helps us help more people. How To's executive producer is Derek John. Rosemary Belson, Kevin Bendis, and Jabari Butler produced this episode. Merritt Jacob is senior technical director. Charles Duhigg created the show. And I'm Carvel Wallace. Thanks for listening. <laughs>